For all the lies and half-truths being told about return to office plans, very few people are talking about the real reason companies want you back. I guess that's why you're here. So let's get to it. In my last video, we detailed the three most common lies or myths being used as rationales for the return to office push. Of course, we debunked each and every one in detail. I'll post it somewhere up here at the end of this video as well, in case you missed it. Because you see, if you read every pro return to the office opinion piece, every CEO interview, you're gonna hear the same thing over and over, a complete lack of justification. In fact, every point of data we have points to the fact that allowing your knowledge workers to work from home or wherever they feel most comfortable raises productivity, lowers cost, improves morale, and reduces attrition. It works. And it's what your most valuable employees want. So why not let them? And if you do have a good reason, why are you keeping it to yourself? Why has no one yet explained this reason? Why not talk about it? Why keep it a secret? What is this thing that cannot be named? Recently, Google and its parent company Alphabet, which of course owns YouTube, I love you. Pushed back their return to office plans into next year due to the Delta variant. Now, I've always thought Google was a really interesting company to watch on this front. They were among the first to close offices at the start of the pandemic. They limited corporate travel and in general continued to make money, boatloads of money, working fully remotely. So why after nearly two years of this would they start to push for coming back to the office at all? Well, Google and Alphabet are many things. Of course, they make most of their money in advertising and in the buying and selling of access to our personal data for marketing purposes. But they are also involved in private equity, venture capital, artificial intelligence, fitness wearables, fiber internet, real estate, robotics, mobile devices, connected home, human health, autonomous driving, and drone-based deliveries. Did you catch it? Earlier this year, Jeff Pilch published this eye-opening article on Million Acres, a Motley Fool publication, that goes in to explain just how deeply invested Google and its parent company Alphabet are in the world of commercial real estate. With 130,000 employees, Google owns tons of office space, as well as huge data centers around the world. Just in the San Francisco Bay Area, they are already the third largest real estate holder overall. In 2018, they made the two largest real estate transactions in the U.S. And then in 2019, they added an additional $13 billion in real estate across the country for a grand total of more than $40 billion in commercial real estate assets on their balance sheet. And some of these very expensive assets are so expensive because of where they're located. Yes, you have the 2 million square foot Googleplex in Mountain View, California, right there in Silicon Valley. But... That monstrosity is dwarfed by their 2.9 million square foot headquarters in a little place known as Manhattan, New York, New York. Now, as far as I know, Google owns all of these buildings outright, and I'm sure the costs to maintain them aren't nothing, but by and large, these are sunk costs, yet they rest on the balance sheet at a value determined by the current commercial real estate market. So what happens even to a company as good at making money as Google, when people realize that $40 billion in assets is really only worth, what, 30 or 20 billion? What happens to the stock price when that much value disappears? What happens to the board of directors? What happens to the leadership team? Do they keep their jobs? What happens when the commercial real estate bubble bursts? Google, of course, would survive but there are a lot of companies that wouldn't. Most commercial real estate is super highly leveraged. They're bought almost completely with borrowed money. And if the value of that collateral crashes, then someone is always left holding the bag. This is why you are seeing landlords all across Manhattan, for example, leave their buildings unoccupied instead of lowering the rents to attract new tenants. I saw this in my recent trip, building after building in prime real estate areas completely vacant. You see, if they accept lower rents, then the value of the property goes down and they will be underwater on their pre-pandemic loans. This year, in 2021, 
we're going to see a total of $430 billion in commercial real estate debt mature. Property owners who fall behind on debt payments will have to dump more money into their properties, sell at a loss, or turn the property over to the banks. So when you examine the propaganda being thrown around about the need to return to the office, look very carefully at who's talking. You'll have the property owners way over leveraged and at risk of devaluation. You'll have the bankers desperate to keep the bubble inflated to avoid another great recession. You'll have the real estate investment firms, the REITs like Blackstone and Starwood. You'll have local officials wanting to inflate the tax base. You're going to have real estate agents, real estate experts who want to keep those commissions flowing. And then you're going to have all the adjacent industries from architecture and office design firms to caterers, hotels, taxi services. This is the cabal. They are waging an organized propaganda campaign to keep this bubble inflated at all costs, to avoid even talking about the existence of the bubble, and to avoid the consequences of their unfortunate pre-pandemic business decisions. But as far as I see it, they're too late. We are quickly approaching the end of our second year fully remote. There is a talent crisis in America and many parts of the world. Good people are hard to find and we have power too. So I say, let it pop. Let the billionaires take it on the chin. Let's see those empty offices converted into condos. Let's see storefronts filled with new businesses and new ideas instead of sitting vacant waiting for 2019 to return. Let's start demanding the truth from our leaders. I'm Steve, thank you for watching Live Work Live. Remember work is not a place, it's a pursuit. See you next week.